relationship series is in October. It is. How many know Ruth has more to say to us than about finding a man? We're going to Ruth. You're welcome to turn in your Bibles or on your apps, or I believe it may be on the screen, but we're going to go to the book of Ruth. We're going to read two sections. We're going to read the first five verses of Ruth 1, and then we're going to read the first seven of Ruth chapter 2. And you can stay with me while we do this part. Ruth chapter 1 in the Word reads, In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. And so a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech, and his wife's name was Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malin and Kilian. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem, Judah. And they went to Moab, and they lived there. Now, Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died. And when she left, and she was left with her two sons, they married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other Ruth. After they had lived there about 10 years, both uh, Malin and Killian also died. And Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. When Naomi heard, <clears throat> excuse me, we're going to go over to chapter 2. If you're following with me, go ahead over to chapter 2. We're going to start with verse 1. Now, Naomi had a relative on her husband's side, a man of great standing from the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, let me go to the fields and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone in whose eyes I have favor. Naomi said to her, go ahead, my daughter. And so she went out into the field and began to glean behind the harvesters. And as it turned out, she was working in the field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech. Just then, Boaz arrived from Bethlehem and greeted the harvesters. The Lord be with you. The Lord bless you, they answered. Now Boaz asked the overseer of the harvesters, who, is that young who does that young woman belong to? The overseer replied, she is the Moabite who came back from Moab with Naomi. She said, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves behind the harvesters. She came into the field and has remained here from morning until now, except for a short time of rest in the shelter. You may rest in your seats. She came into the field and has remained here from morning until now, except for a short rest in the shelter. Y'all doing all right this morning? Yeah. Lord, would you just speak to us this morning? Whatever we've brought in, Father, I just ask that would you just lift it off of us? Whatever is on our mind, God, would you just sit inside? If there are concerns that are weighing on our heart, if there are things that have been troubling us, would you give us just a peace right now to know that you have it all under control? Would you be present with us? Would you help us hear you in Jesus' name? Amen. So this story is a very, uh, I don't know if popular is the right word, but perhaps a, a very popular Christian story. It seems to be the story of Ruth and Naomi is one that goes across culture, even outside of Christian spaces. We tend to know the story of Ruth and Naomi. You hear uh, cultural terms of phrase on the internet all the time saying, hey, you got to find your Boaz or you got to let your Boaz find you. How many are familiar with this story? We're familiar. Y'all don't be quiet on me this morning. We're familiar with this story. And so that seems to be the thing we do with Ruth, right? We put her in sort of that box. We put her in the box of like, she's a good daughter-in-law. And because she was a good daughter-in-law, she got a man. And if you want to get a man, you're going to have to do what she did, right? And we're like, God, Lee, I got to lose all of my things. I got to work in the yard. I got to, right? We put her in this box, but there's so much to this story. This story is so rich. As a matter of fact, this story is actually a, a hinge story. This is an aside, but I like to share history, right? So this story is actually kind of a hinge story. It uh, hinges two parts of uh, Israel's history. This uh, part of the history where they were led by judges, which was God's preference for them, right? This sort of communal way of leadership. And then it hinges to the time when they got a king, 
the thing they preferred because they saw the unbelieving communities, they saw the non-believing communities have a king, and so they felt like, God, give us a king, and God is like, that's not my preference, but the people kept crying out to God for a king, and so God gives them a king, and so this story of Ruth is kind of the hinge story in that whole um, part of history. Right? It starts out by telling us that. It starts out by saying, in the days, right, when Israel was ruled by judges. And why this is important is because of her lineage. Right? We know, some of you may know, Ruth is an ancestor of Jesus. And so this is important because that means she's also an ancestor of David. And so it's, it's positioned right where it is, right, to kind of turn the page on their history. And so a story like that has lots of things that we can learn from it, lots of things that I believe that God wants us to take from it. But today, the thing I want us to keep in mind is the title that I'm going to be coming from, and it's I'm Stuck in a Rut. I'm going to say it again because somebody is right there (laughs) already this morning. Somebody was telling God that just yesterday. Somebody told God that on the way here. I don't even know if I want to come. I am stuck in a rut. So Ruth and Naomi, they are part of this family that lives in Bethlehem, and they're experiencing a famine, and so they're trying to find a space where there might be more provision. And so uh, Elimelech takes Naomi, and they go to Moab. And Moab, they go there, and they're there for a while, and uh, while they're there, their sons marry two Moabite women. One is Orpah, and one is Ruth. And over the course of time, we know, we know what happens, right? The end of the story, not the end of the story, the, a big part of the story, a big turn in the story is it ends up, it's just Naomi and Ruth, right? They have death all around them, and it's the two of them, and they are traveling back to Bethlehem. They have dealt with this family, that famine, and now they've moved back to what's familiar. Ruth and Naomi find themselves stuck in a series of unfortunate events. They're in an emotional rut, right? They are grieving a husband, and then grieving a son and brother-in-law, and then grieving another husband and a son, right? All of this in this decade period until their family is whittled down because they're not only losing them, but as they decide to journey back, right? Naomi is so grieved. She tells her other daughter-in-law, Orpha, she tells both of them, actually, she says, just go ahead back to your people. Don't even worry about me. I'm fine. Just go. She can't, her heart is so heavy. She's in this emotional rut that she doesn't even want to drag them down with her. She says, just go back to your people where you know it's familiar and leave me to myself. And as we know the story, Orpha, right, she's kissed by her mother in law and she goes on back to her people. And Ruth is the one that bears down and she's like, absolutely not. Where you go, I'll go, right? Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. You're tracking, we're familiar? And so they go back together, and they're in this emotional rut together. Ruth decides, if you're going to be down in the rut, I'm going to be down in the rut. They're not just in an emotional rut, they're in a financial rut. Think about it. These are women of a particular time, right? They're a part of this clan. They're a part of this small uh, unit within this clan, right? And we know that they lose three adult men which means these are three working people out of their household. That's a lot of money that's coming out. That's a lot of resource already in a time where things are scarce. And so they find themselves, right, just two women having to make a way on their own. And they're in this financial rut trying to figure it out together. So now some of you may be saying, now exactly what is a rut? I want to give us some clarity about what we're talking about so that we know if you're there. Some of you are like, I already know I'm there. You don't even have to tell me. Mm-hmm. But I want to give us clarity on exactly what a rut is. A rut is defined as two things. One is defined as a long, deep track made by the repeated passage of the wheels of a vehicle. Right? If any of you ever have done any sort of off-roading, any sort of like four-wheeling or any sort of mountain biking, things like that, and you go off-road, you know a rut is sometimes happens when the soil is kind of soft and you get your wheels just right? And no matter how many times the wheels spin, it's not moving. That's stuck in a rut, stuck in the mud. The second way that a rut is defined is like this. It's a habit or a pattern of behavior that has become dull and unproductive. 
but it's hard to change. I don't even see enough people right. I'm going to just say it one more time. Because my, my Bible study people know how I feel about notes. I'm going to say it one more time. A, a rut is a habit or a pattern of behavior that has become dull and unproductive, but it's hard to change. It's the same old cycle over and over again. Sometimes we even like to tag it. We say, it's a generational curse. It's a way for us to throw off the blame. It's not my fault I'm in this rut. It's somebody else's that came before me, right? It's a cycle over and over again. It's the spinning of your wheels. It's the here we go again type of feeling. Anybody ever had that here we go again? No matter how many times I spin my wheels, God, how am I still in this rut? Naomi and Ruth, they understand this completely, right? Remember I said they're in a famine, and on top of that, the people that they love most just keep leaving, and not even by choice. There are no food prospects. There are no husband prospects. That isn't a part of the story when they, uh, right, when they first experience this loss. It's not like there's somebody just waiting in the wings like, I got you, girl. No, there are no prospects for things getting better, and so they're in the rut. And they can't physically see how anything is going to get better than it is right now. The problem with being in a rut is that you have the immediate inclination to just keep digging in, to keep doing the same thing that got you there. Anybody ever spun their wheels? Anybody look up and you're like, God, how did I get here again? And you realize just a little bit later I've been doing the same thing that I've been doing. Somebody said the definition, and I don't even know if it's an a, a actual clinical definition or not, but that the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. And so I'd argue that maybe the definition of insanity is just sitting in the rut, right? Maybe at some point your tires were moving. Maybe at some point you were going for it. You're like, I wasn't even always here. I don't even know how I got here because there was a time where my tires were moving and I was going through. Maybe there was a time you had no issue at all. Everything felt like smooth sailing. But I want to tell you that when you are stuck, the only thing that you can do is stop and assess. God, how do I move now? Ruth decided that she had to do something different. And so she got out in the field and she began to gather. The Bible says that she went, uh, she wasn't worried about who was going to see her working, right? The Bible says that she got out in the field and she got her wheat. And not even just the wheat, because here's the thing. She wasn't just grabbing bundles of wheat. The Bible says that she said, you know what? In this season, I'm going to do what I have to do. And so if somebody just leaves a little something behind, then I'm going to grab it. God, I don't even know because there was a season where it felt like maybe I was supposed to have abundance, but God, if you just let me get the remnants, I'm going to grab it, right? And so she didn't worry about who, who thought something about her grabbing the remnants. She wasn't worried about somebody else's opinion. She wasn't worried about, at, like we're worried about her story, if it was a trick to get a man. She wasn't worried about if Boaz was in fact going to see her. Her getting out there and putting her hands to work was her saying, God, I trust you in the place where you have put me. It wasn't as much as she hoped, but it was that season's portion. She didn't go out there working with a deadline or a minimum for her to call it success. She said, Lord, if you put me here, then I'll start with the remnant. I'll start with just the little pieces, and I'll trust you with the rest. I'll trust you with the reward. And how do we know that there's a reward to your faithfulness? Well, the Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 11, the Bible says, and without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and he rewards those who earnestly seek him. And so she said, God, I don't see the reward right now. I don't see how me having faith, how me being in this new place where I don't have my husband, where I don't have my brother-in-law, where I don't have my father-in-law, where we don't really know anybody because this isn't my home country. I don't see how it's going to come together. I don't see how those things are going to turn into these things. But I believe that just because you said it's going to happen, it's going to happen. Amen. And some of us get in seasons 
And we get so frustrated because all we see are the little pieces. And we start to believe, God, you must have forgotten about me. God, where is my bundle? Where is my big portion? Where is my basket? Because I'm looking at other people carrying baskets, but all you have me doing is picking up the pieces. And so we get frustrated and we get tired and we get disappointed and we get bitter and we say, God, you must have forgotten all about me. And we start asking people to pray because then we say, well, I can't even pray because obviously God is not listening to me because all he has me doing is picking up the pieces. Here's the thing. Ruth sees something very clearly. She sees that now is not the time for her to give up. She had to believe that the God that she told Naomi that she would follow would make a way as she worked. Somebody needs to hear that, that as you work, God will make a way. When we begin to lose faith in doing the work that God has assigned to our hands, we risk a couple things, right? We risk stopping too short. And we risk confusing our seasons. That's really what's happening, right? When we start getting frustrated with these remnants, what often happens is we're confusing our seasons. We hear about, let me go with me. For those of you who have your notes and those of you who have your Bibles, in Ecclesiastes 3. Mm -hmm. Some of you already know what this is. Ecclesiastes 3, you, you know what it is because you've had to go there to remind yourself. For those who don't know, I'm going to help you. It says there's a time for everything. And a season for every activity under the heavens. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to uproot. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to tear down and a time to build. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to search and a time to give up. A time to keep and a time to throw away. And it goes on to say, what do workers gain from their toil? God, what do I get from all this? What do I even get for, for, for still spinning my wheels? What do I even get for picking up these little pieces? What do I get, even get? Just this? What do I get for all of this hard work that I'm putting in and I'm not seeing the results? I'm not seeing the reward. What is it that I get, God? Right? The Bible goes on and it says, I've seen the burden that God has laid on the human race. He's made everything beautiful in its time. Everything beautiful in its time. And verse 12 says, I know that there's nothing better for people than to be happy and to do good while they live, that each of them may eat and drink and find satisfaction in their toil. This is the gift of God. Some of you can't even enjoy the season that you're in. You're missing the beauty that you're in because you're so ready to get to the next one. You're like, God, I don't want this hard season. I need you to give me the bigger season. I need you to give me the easy season. How do I get on that list? I've asked that exact question. How do I get on the easy list? Right? We ask that at the end of the year. That's the ongoing online joke. We say, God, I just want to make sure I'm not on the strong soldiers list. Just want to be clear that I'm not on that list. But what if it's that season? What if the only way you're going to get to the season of the basket is you have to walk through the season of the remnants? What if the only way that you're going to see the reward is if you're willing to stick through the toil, if you're willing to do the work? You can't confuse the season. She came during harvest time. And how many of us, we've talked about this, I believe it might have been in our Bible study this last week. We love to talk about harvest time in the church, right? Y'all like, yeah, I'm going to be quiet until you start talking about harvest because you bought that basket of wheat. So are you going to tell us the harvest is coming? My God, the harvest is coming. It's here. Is that what you're waiting for me to say? What if I told you this is it? You're like, you're not about to tell, uh, uh, uh. that's not the culmination of the, what if I told you that there's a season for everything and this might be your season and that there's a blessing even in this, even here, even where you are, there's beauty, even where you are, God is working, even where you are, God hasn't forgotten you. Here's the thing about harvest season. We love to talk about it. And what I was sharing with them is we love to talk about harvest season. It's so exciting, right? We're like, yes, God, you bring it into me, you meet my harvest, God. This, oh, come on, I'm about to run. Oh. But we don't even know what harvest is. Because if you come from any sort of farming community, we, when we say we country, we mean we country. To be clear. 
We're from the country, like live next door to the cows, country. And harvest season is not skipping season. Harvest season is not relaxing season. Harvest season is not, I'm about to put my feet up and chill because God done brought me into my reward. Listen, if God is bringing you into harvest, here's the, here's the tip. God is bringing you into work. Because in farming, harvest is the working season. You've been planting, you've been caring for the crops. But harvest season is when the work happens. Because you got to bring all of that in. This stuff doesn't put itself in the basket. As a matter of fact, one of the things I shared is that during harvest season, a lot of times people have to get other farm hands to come in and help because it's labor. But we don't want the labor. We want the reward. Am I right? It's okay. I know it's true. I'm talking to myself. If I ain't even talking to you, I'm talking to me. I already read. I'm fine. The problem is we want the basket, but we give up too soon. We give up too soon. You leave your post. And here's the thing, because I know what I'm telling you right now is going against culture. Excuse me. <clears throat> I know what I'm saying to you right now is like, what? Uh-uh, because I'm in my season of rest. <laughs> I'm in my season of looking out for me. Okay, dude, you might not say it like that. Listen, I'm in my season of rest. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because I be taking care of everybody else. I'm in my season of resting. What, whoever you are. The culture has told us that we all are supposed to be in this big season of relaxing and ease and napping. All the things, right? We've been told this and we hold on to it. And the problem is that for every one of God's truths, culture and the enemy has a counterfeit. Let me explain. So the Bible talks about the importance and the necessity of Sabbath rest. Right? But it also speaks of the importance and the necessity of diligence and consistency and hard work and persistence. Sabbath rest is one day. How many more days do we have that we have to put in the work? But we're not talking about that because it's not sexy and it's not fun and it doesn't tell us to run for our basket and I don't have to put you in a hundred dollar line and tell you if you just give us a hundred dollars that God is gonna bring you into your harvest. What I can tell you is that if you stay in the position that God has put you in, if you stay on post, that God will do exactly what God says because God is a rewarder and God rewards those who earnestly seek him. Amen. Amen. Ruth 2.7, I love that last verse. It says, she has worked from morning until now, except for a short rest in the shelter. I need y'all to hear that as what it says. She's worked from morning until now, except for a short rest in the shelter. And if you know anything about Old Testament especially, the shelter is something often rest, refer, referring to our God. So she's worked from morning until now, except for a short rest in the shelter. Why do I say that? Why does that shelter matter? Because in this time where we're talking so much about self-care and rest, let me tell you this, that self-care without God is just a nap. Mm. Self-care without God is just a spa day. Mm. Mm. Self-care without God is just another day off. Because there's no way you can take care of yourself if you're not communing with the one who's told you who you are. There's no way. How are you taking care of yourself if you don't know who you are? How? And so she rests under the shelter. She takes her time before she gets out and says, God, I'm back out here. I'm getting what I got to get. I'm getting these pieces because 
I trust you with this season. I don't understand why I lost my husband and I don't understand why I lost my brother-in-law and I don't understand why my sister-in-law is gone. I don't understand it, but what I'm telling you is that I trust you. Sabbath rest is our reminder that we are not God. Diligence and hard work and persistence are reminders that with God, though, all things are possible, even in the suffering season. Suffering is a word we hate so much, I know it. I'm not, this isn't even a finger wag. This is really me just looking in a mirror. Because who wants to suffer? We hate that. We're like, God, I don't want to suffer. I don't want to have to be out here working hard. I don't want to have to be out here doing that. I want the ease. I want, Lord, where is my inheritance? How come I couldn't get it, right? How come I couldn't benefit from some, some nepotism or something, right? We don't want that. We don't want the struggle. We don't want to have to lose things and lose people. We don't even care about the big picture sometimes. We're like, God, I know I'm sad and tired right now. <laughs> And Jesus corrects us so quickly. There's this part in the New Testament where Jesus says this, right? It's, it's, the, it's the scripture, it's this part of his story where he's telling the people to eat of his flesh and drink of his blood, right? If they want to be with, one with him, they're going to have to suffer. And the Bible says the people were like, uh-uh. The people were like, this is a hard thing. Who can accept this? And so many of them left. And when we come across texts like that, we're like, how could you just leave Jesus? What do you mean? We do it every day. We do it every day. We say, God, it's too hard. Just forget it. Just forget it. If all I'm going to get is that after all the hard work I'm getting, just forget it. We leave him every day. And sometimes, right, we leave quietly. And we think that we're punishing God. And so we go, I'm going to take a break, right? It's that cultural counterfeit. It's the enemy's counterfeit for that Sabbath rest. And we go, I need some rest. I'm so torn up by this season that I just need to take a break from Bible study, devotion, church, small groups. We get so in our own mind about what our seasons should be that we start to think that Sabbath is a rest from God instead of knowing that Sabbath is a rest for God. We get that day, we get that time to stop with the hard work, to remind ourselves of why we're doing it in the first place. I know I'm talking, even if you're quiet, I'm fine. So why do people often stop working, right? If the Bible has told us that there's an importance to continuing to get out in the field, to continue to glean, even if it's just some of the leftovers, right? If God has told us it's important to write scripture after scripture after scripture talks about the essential nature of hard work. If so, then why do we often stop working? It's easy. There are a few things. One, because it's too hard. Right? We're like, oh, this is hard. I don't want to do this. Anybody ever said that? Like, this is hard. I don't want to do it. It's too hard. Somebody said, I said it today. I looked at those children crying while I was supposed to be here ready to preach and I'm trying to get them in the car and I noticed one side of the car seat's not in and I looked and I'm like I'm trying to serve you it's too hard Ruth was back then in a field just getting left and at no point did she say, God, it's too hard. She had lost everything. And she was still back there doing the work. Even if it's hard, will you get what God has left behind for you? Will you trust when that God is doing something in this season? Or will you just quit and say, it's too hard? Number two, why people often quit the hard work of their season because it's taking too long. We're like, now hold on, God. You called me to do this. You asked me to work on this job or work after the, try this vision. You asked me to live into this calling or live into this purpose. You asked me to do this thing. You asked me to go to this place and you said, you're gonna set it up for me. Lord, you know who told me to go to Nashville. I done been here for two years, three years, four years, five years. I've been here for a decade and I don't see it turning out the way that I thought it would be. It's taking too long. How long is it going to be before the people on my job recognize me and give me the promotion that I think I deserve? How long? 
How long am I going to be in this marriage before things actually change? How long? It takes too long. Ruth and Naomi, they went out. They went through the famine that sent them to Moab. They went through the years of losing their loved ones. They went on a seven, it would take seven to 10 days of that walk they did, that 50 mile walk from Moab back to Bethlehem. They did it anyway, grieving and sad and crying. They did it anyway, it took long. Are we quitting too soon? Have you decided God, you know what? Honestly, I, I kind of gave you six months. And maybe you're thinking you don't do that, but sometimes we do it with our vision boards. We're like, we get to December and we're like, uh-uh, just forget it. If he didn't do it this year, that means it wasn't God's will for my life. It wasn't, right? But what if when you're asking PK, PT, hey, listen, I've been going through this and it's been taking a long time. What if my most honest answer for you was just keep working? How many of you would continue to listen? How many of you would continue to work? What if the answer is grow where you're planted? Ugh. Because it's not what we want to do, God. It's taking too long. There are other people who go way past me, going way faster. It's taking too long. Number three, right? So we said it's too hard. It's taking too long. Number three, because you're too concerned about what other people have to say. How often do we quit because we're like, Lord, well, you told me to work on this thing. You gave me this vision, and now everybody looking at me like I'm crazy. They haven't worn fruit yet. I feel stupid. I don't have anything to even put on Instagram. I'm supposed to have a page for this thing you got me doing. Hell, what, what am I putting pictures up of? I ain't talking to everybody. I'm just talking to everybody. <laughs> We get too concentrated on what everybody else has to say instead of the assignment that God has put us to, and we move our feet before God has told us to move. And then we're wondering, like, what direction should I go? You were supposed to stay planted, but the remnants weren't enough. The daily bread wasn't enough for you. You said, God, I don't want the daily bread. I want the feast. And God is like, keep working. We have to follow the examples that the Lord has already given us. The woman with the issue of blood. Years and years and years and years of suffering. I want us to think about this. When we talk about this woman with the issue of blood, many people, there, there's been lots of speculation about what this could have been. Most common, a lot of people think um, that maybe this is some sort of um, very old version of women dealing with something like fibroid endometriosis and if anybody in here statistically I know it's fact if anybody in here has dealt with this and I'll explain it for my gentlemen in the room it is the most not just uncomfortable not just painful but sometimes humiliating condition to walk in because you don't know what kind of surprise you're going to get and so I want us to think about this. This woman was walking around for 12 years with this issue of blood. When I was in Rwanda, there was a woman who, she got on a bus, we were on this little tiny bus trying to travel. And when I tell you when she stepped on, the smell was so immediate and so noticeable. It was like old blood. And everyone immediately, no one said anything, just began to cover their nose. And I think about, I thought immediately about the woman in the Bible with the issue of blood. And what it must have been like for her to press anyway, for her to go anyway, for her to believe anyway, even in the seasons where God didn't change it, in year one when God didn't change it, in year two when God didn't change it, in year three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, until God actually changed something. But she believed that he would. And I often think like, God, how long will we wait for you to respond? How long will we press in? How long will we pursue you? How long is long enough? We've been given examples. We have the man who was lowered through the roof by his friends, right? We have this man who was sick 
and his friends are so desperate for him to be healed, they tear the roof off of the house that Jesus is in and they lower him in. Do you have friends, do you have people around you who will tell you to stick it out and not encourage you to nap or squint? Because you think that they love you because they tell you to quit, but they don't. Because if they love you, they tell you the hard thing. They say, I love you so much, I want you to keep going, but I got you. I'll lift your arms while you go. If I gotta carry you, if I gotta help you do the work, I got you, don't quit. Because what's in you is too important. What's in you is too promising. I need somebody in here to remember that what's in you is too important. What's in you is too promising to quit in this season. I know that it's hard, but what's in you, it's growing roots. Something's coming from it. I know that you want to quit. I know exactly what it feels like to be tired, but I'm telling you, God is doing something. If only the oak trees could stop being jealous of the apples. Somebody got it. Because the apple trees, they'll go pretty quickly, right? It's beautiful. The fruit is gorgeous. It tastes delicious. But the oak tree, those little seeds got to just wait and watch season after season as people just enjoy the fruit. But what if you're an oak tree? What if God is making you stronger and bigger and more purposeful than you ever imagined? And all you got to do is stay planted. All you got to do is not quit on what God has planted inside of you. I want us to see a quick video before, before we go. If, uh, let me see if they were able to pull it up. I want us to watch a video. And it's a truck that gets stuck in the rut. And I want you to pay attention to what you see. And I want you to pay uh, a quick attention to what you hear. Mm. This is not the beginning. <laughs> but that's okay. Can you pause it for a second? I'm going to explain to you what you see. So what you're seeing is this is a big pickup truck. And what's happened is he's gone out in his field and he's gotten stuck in a rut. And he's spinning his tires and spinning his tires. And all of a sudden, he says, this gentleman says, but I saw something one time that somebody else did and it worked. And it got him out of the rut. And so he hops out of his car and he begins to work on it. You can go ahead and press play. Well, we're going to see if this is going to work. I don't think it's going to. Um, this truck's just too heavy. The truck weighs 11,000 pounds, so I'm going to set the camera up. Hopefully, this works, because if not, I'm going to have to get a tractor.
you to stop it, right? You can stop it right there. Now, I want to explain what you just saw because this is a common trick. It's become a common trick to getting your truck out of the mud. What some off-roaders and farmers have discovered that if you take your wheels and you tie them to something that's wider and firmer than your wheels, then it'll begin to, as you spin, to dig you out. And the more you spin, the more the thing that's wider, the thing that's firmer, gives it a foundation and it will dig you out. And as you see him driving off, what happens? He stopped and he said, if I would have kept going, if I would have kept going, I wouldn't have got stuck again. Because let me tell you what happens for the next minute and a half of this video. He stops and he gets stuck just a little bit again. And the passenger side starts to slip off, right? Because sometimes we have somebody with us. We have people that are on our side and they start to slip off. And it's okay because he puts it back together and he starts to dig. And he, he sees, you know what? I really shouldn't have stopped. I should have kept going. And that's okay because his friend comes. And his friend has a truck that's bigger than his head. And his friend says, I'll help you get out. But the problem is, his friend gets stuck. Because sometimes we get help. We're like, I, I, I thought this person could help me, but now they're just as bad as I am. His friend gets stuck. And then they realize they need something more powerful than both of them. And you're sitting here, you're like, but I did the thing. I tied myself to something that's firmer, to a stronger foundation than the wheels of my life. I did. I gave myself to Jesus. I said yes. And he's pulled me out the rut. So why isn't it easier? Why am I just cruising? Because the Bible says that some things come by only fasting and prayer. So even in this season, even though you want to give up, I'm telling you, just because you feel stuck doesn't mean you have to quit. I'm telling you, just keep working. Because if you are tied to the right thing, if you are tied to the right foundation, I am telling you that you're not going to stay in the mud. If you're willing to go get it out of the mud, if you're willing to tie yourself to God and not stop until you go from here to there, that God is a rewarder of those who earnestly seek him. I am telling you that I understand. I never tell you anything that I'm guessing. I promise you that. I'm never telling you anything that just sounds like a good idea. I'm telling you not what I heard, but what I know. I know exactly what it's like to want to quit. I know exactly what it's like to want to give up, but I'm telling you that we have a firm foundation. And as long as you keep yourself tied to it, keep doing the work. When they get on your nerves, keep doing the work. You have something bigger, something better, something stronger. Because here's the thing about Ruth's story. This is what I love. Here's what you need to know about Boaz in this story. So Boaz is what scripture and the Hebrew culture call a kinsman redeemer. So in that time, when a woman lost her husband, they would have what's called a kinsman redeemer. It usually is the next of kin, the man, right? Who would be able to, uh, who also, also had to qualify by being financially able to take care of her. And so usually she would marry him, right? He, she'd come under his household and he would take care of her. He'd redeem her story, right? And that's so important in this because Ruth doesn't go in there with any intention other than I'm going to be faithful in this season. I'm going to bring in the little pieces of the harvest until God does more. And it's as she's working that her kinsman redeemer recognizes her. And what I want you to know is that as you're working, Jesus, your kinsman redeemer, the one who redeems your story, the one who tells you that your work is not for nothing, he is seeing you. He is not blind to what you are doing. I'm telling you that just like Ruth got at his feet, you're going to have to stay at the feet of Jesus and say, God, I'm going to work until you tell me to do something different. It is not the fun story. It is not the fun sermon. It is not the exciting, sexy thing that you can go, yes, I'm walking out of here knowing when I get in my car, God has changed everything. When you walk out of here, there's more work. But I'm telling you that you're not doing it by yourself. That God is with you. That God is for you. And that if you got to find somebody else to go with you, then find them. And if that's not working, right? If they can't pull you out and they're stuck, then y'all pray and y'all fast. But don't get off of your post until God tells you to move. Let's stand on our feet. 
I want to pray for us. I want to pray. Because I have complete assurance that so many of you have things that God has put in your heart. And you're like, God, it's not even like I'm just sitting by and doing nothing about it. I'm working. And you're tired. You're looking for the fruit, you don't see it. You worried if you look like Boo Boo the Fool. And you're ready to just give up. You're like, just forget it. I did what I could do. And God, obviously, your hand is not on this because nothing's happening. Listen to me. I get it. And I'm going to pray for you. My prayer is that you would trust the word of God. I want to, as we prepare to pray, I'm Romans 5. Romans 5, verse 3. It's dark, but I'm reading. Because this is what I want us to pray over. Romans 5, verse 3. And it says, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings. Because we know that suffering produces perseverance. And perseverance, character, and character, hope. And that hope does not put us to shame. Because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. I have written, this is my, I couldn't even bring my preaching Bible. I had to bring my study Bible. I, that verse, verse 7, Romans 5, verse 7, at just the right time. If that's the thing you could just hold in your heart, that at just the right time. I know you're like, but why can't it be now? But at just the right time, I promise you, the word of the Lord will not fall flat over your life. The Bible said it does not go out and return void, but it accomplishes what it set out to do. The Bible says that God watches over his word to perform. He watches to make sure that what he said about you is going to come to pass at just the right time. Because some of the things we've been asking for to happen now, if they would have happened when we wanted them, we wouldn't even been ready for them. They would have torn us apart. We're like, I'm ready, I'm mature. God is like, not yet. Father, we just thank you. Because we know what it's like to want to give up. We know what it's like when it's hard. Lord, we know what it's like when we're tired. And so, Father, we just name that thing. If that's you, I want you to tell the Lord that right now. Lord, I'm tired. Lord, your sons and daughters are tired. They're frustrated. They're confused. They're, they're searching. They don't understand why they've been going so hard and they don't see it yet. They're wondering why the fruit hadn't broken through the ground. But God, today, my prayer.